who's going to speak about our ability to think beyond the world's biggest business. What is the world's biggest business? War. So we have Dr. Suman Agarwal. Yes, she's going to speak to us about our ability to think beyond war. All of us uh, in this room, if I asked you a question, would you prefer to use violence or non-violence to resolve conflict? I'm sure you would say, I would prefer non-violence. And yet, all the adults living in democracies, that includes you and me, since we have the power, of, power to vote, we have all politically legitimized violence as a means of conflict resolution. I'll explain. It means that whenever there will be conflict between nation states, I'm limiting myself to nation states because I want to show you in these few minutes how all of us, if we combine together, we have the ability to move towards a world beyond war. Or beyond war means between nation states at least. Let me limit it to that. So we have politically legitimized violence as a means of conflict resolution. That means we have consciously decided when there will be um, conflict between nation states, we will use violence to resolve it. And we are spending $2 million plus on this. This is the global military expenditure, which is increasing by the day. If we want to move beyond war, and since I'm a Gandhian scholar, I have talk, according to Gandhi, power is popular, not elitist. That popular means people's power. People have the power. Each one of us are very, very powerful human beings. And I think I Congo, I congratulate them for uh, exhibiting this power in each, in, in each and every individual who are able to make a difference in the lives and lives of others. So all of us have this potential. And if it can come together, it's, uh, the, this whole in, it's an international initiative for the political legitimization of non-violent conflict resolution. This is, there are three demands we make to, to, uh, for, from every government around the world. Very briefly, the first demand is, and I use the word demand, not a request, because as citizens living in democracies, we have the right to demand the, the right. So, I mean, the right to demand the right, using it in both ways. So the first demand is that without abandoning the present military defense, because a lot of people get heart attacks, that, oh, kya ho jayega, military system khatam ho jayega. So let's keep that machinery of war. And of course, uh, I'm very happy to note that all of you know that how the arms trade fuels it and how it's basically the military industrial complex, uh, which we have to also tackle. So without abandoning the present military defense, a parallel non-violent defense be instituted in every country. This means that there is a defense ministry in every country. We keep that, but it's a military defense. You keep that, but parallel to it, not part of it, because governments are excellent at co-opting things, but parallel to it, every country starts a non-violent non uh, defense, non-violence ministry first. I call it non-violence, not a peace ministry, because peace is a very loaded word. You need nuclear weapons to keep the peace. So that is why non-violence ministry. And at the grassroots level, like you have NDA, IMA in India, you have West Point in the States, in Israel. I mean, everywhere you have a military academy where you learn how to use violence. You learn how to use a gun. It's not natural to know how to use a gun or a machine gun. You learn how to do that. So you, every country will start a non-violence training academy. I am only a Gandhian expert, but there are non-violent defense experts uh, who have been working with this concept uh, for the past uh, 25 years, quarter of a century, there's Robert Burroughs in Australia, there's Gene Sharp at Harvard. I have lectured there and talked to them, they are friends of mine. So there's a blueprint of what will be adopted there. Very briefly, what will be adopted by these non in, what will you teach in the Nonviolence Academy? There are 198 nonviolent tactics which have to be learned. Concrete, it's nothing wishy washy vague. Concrete tactics. Number two, the history of nonviolence will be taught. There are 24 cases in history, all in black and white, where nonviolence has successfully delivered in politics. Number three, nonviolent communication. We speak giraffe. Uh, we speak wolf, but how to speak giraffe? If there's time, I can give you an example later on. So, nonviolent communication. Then the philosophy of nonviolence. After all, if thou shalt not kill, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and ahimsa parma dharm, then you, it's, it, it, you, you cannot say then it's right to kill your neighbor or it's right to use violence or to go to war. <clears throat> a cannot be both A and not A at the same time. If, if thou shalt not kill is right, then definitely the, uh, to kill or to train systematically to kill is definitely wrong. So this is in a nutshell what will be taught there. And, and of course, non-violence R&D, research and development, 
you know, how much money goes into military R&D. In the same way, non-violence R&D. So that's briefly the first demand. The second is the legal democratic option to be trained in non-violent defense rather than the present military system. Again, uh, when you want to join the defense of your country, which is uh, really glamorized that you're dying for your country, what about, and here we are so schizophrenic. In our schools, we talk about uh, global village, we are stewardship of the earth, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, and when it comes to brass tacks, there we are, nation, for the glory of India, the glory of this. What are we, world citizens or what? And today, you know, we are at the, so closely connected that just have to press a button and you, you reach everybody around the globe. So the legal democratic option to be trained in nonviolent defense. I, uh, when I want to join the defend my country, there should be an option. You want to learn how to use violence? Sure, go ahead. But if you want to learn nonviolence, it has to be learned, by the way. And this is based on Gandhi, where he says nonviolence is a science. If you study Gandhi, read Gandhi, he keeps on talking about nonviolence as a science. Uh, nonviolence is not an emotion, not a sentiment. It's not a mood, it's not a feeling, it's a science. And as a science, if you apply the definition of any science, there are three characteristics. Any science is a systematic body of knowledge with its own laws and principles. Same to nonviolence. And Gandhi is very prophetic. And you have universities in the States and in, uh, in Europe, maybe you're familiar with that, where you can now, you have departments of peace studies. Uh, in India, unfortunately, we don't have it, but and, and that's where I fit in and I teach Gandhian philosophy abroad all the time, teach twice a year in foreign universities. There's always a course on Gandhi in the peace studies department. In India, there's no course on Gandhi. People ask me, can we come and learn Gandhi in India? There's no course. Delhi University does not run a course. There's only a postgraduate research projects in Chandigarh or whatever. Gandhi is part of the Paul Science paper or Philo paper where you're taught part of it. Anyway, so it's, uh, it has to be learned, you know, you have to learn how to use nonviolence. Just as sanskar dalte hain in the same way. And the third demand is the legal option for taxpayers to divert their defense tax from military defense to nonviolent defense. Again, we are not saying we don't want a defense. Of course you want a defense. Who doesn't want a defense? There's always going to be conflict. But it does not have to be violent. So again, Let's say half the taxpayers all over the world sign up. What will happen? One million dollars a minute will still be used for military defense, but one million dollars a minute would be released for non-violent defense. When you want to start something new, I think all of us have been in that predicament. Funds is a problem, and funding is so difficult. So here you would have funds to start your non-violence academy, staff, books, library, research, everything. So, so this is in a nutshell. And since we are talking about Gandhi one here, and okay, yeah, popular minute. power, let me give you something, a radical situation. If Gandhi was here, he would have done that. Because power is popular, people have the power. Let's say if no young person in the whole world joins the army, military or Air Force, no government can have one. Or there is a clause that I will join, to, uh, but I will not go to war, I will not kill. Why kill? Let's personalize war. We have professionalized war. If a, a Pakistani woman's husband is killed, does she feel less pain than an Indian woman's husband is uh, killed or the orphan? It's the same pain. Nobody wins a war. It's vulgar to celebrate victory after a war. So this is what, so this is, it's on popular power, people, at least between nation states. Why don't we make an effort with the people we love? Because according to Gandhi, the law of non-violence non is a law. And I just conclude with this quotation where he says that the law of non-violence, which is the law of love, they're synonyms. And it was very frustrating when I researched Gandhi that how come love and non-violence are synonyms. But uh, and, uh, the law of non-violence, which is the law of love, is the law of our species. You only human when you use non-violence. And he says we have to consciously choose non-violence over violence. Only then we are human. You know, we are the unfinished animal that Theodore Rozak talked about. We are not human beings. And if we start today, let's start today, 50 years, 100 years, there's nothing in world history. If we all start today, we, in 50 years, we'll have the tools, the skills of nonviolent conflict resolution. We'll know how to do it. And maybe your children's grandchildren will look back at us and say, look at them, ek dusre ko marte the, kill karte the. how barbaric. So it's time to think in that way. Um, and Gandhi says, it is a sign of spiritual atrophy to support an unjust structure like war. Spiritual atrophy, you know, is like rheumatism, spiritual atrophy. Our souls are stuck. We can't feel. 
It's not like Gandhi after Chauri Chaura, uh, you know, seven policemen were killed and he called off the non-cooperation movement and the Congress party was so angry with him and he wrote an article in Young India saying, why are you saying only seven uh, uh, policemen were killed, British policemen? Look, go and talk to the wife and the children. Their whole world has gone. It's not only, so everybody's life is very important and when we're talking about mothers, we also have this women for peace because, you know, everybody's somebody's son. How difficult it is to have a child, bear a child, you know, uh, the labor pain, everything, then bring it, bring up the child and then somebody kills it. Why? There's no need. So it's a sign of spiritual atrophy to support an unjust structure like war. And then Gandhi says, you may not be able to change the system at once, but you can always choose not to cooperate with it at once. So this is Satyagraha according to Gandhi. And I, I welcome you all to join it. Thank you, Dr. Subhan Agarwal. That was brilliant. I must start by saying that last year we had Dr. Vijay Mehta, who also works on the issue to address the uh, need for non-violence across the globe. He's based out of the UK, a person of Indian origin, who does a lot of work and he's very well connected with all the dignitaries. He's been trying with all the G8 presidents and prime ministers and he's even published his book, Talking Against War. But there's so much work to be done. It's again a topic very dear to the heart and I'll, it uh, reminds me of what somebody who I really revere and look up to said in the aftermath of 9-11. And this man, Professor Noam Chomsky, said, if you want to stop terrorism, we, the citizens, need to stop participating in acts of terrorism. And he said this on national te television in the US. And the American citizenry went against Noam Chomsky. And they wanted him to apologize because they said, what are you talking about? Because, you know, how can you say that we invited that act of terrorism called 9-11? He said, well, when U.S. taxpayers, he came back on national TV, television and he said, I refuse to apologize because what I've said is the truth. Because when you pay your taxes and you don't question the government about their war agenda, which is done in the name of oil and God and God knows what, you are participating in an act of terrorism because you're killing innocent people in Afghanistan, Gulf countries to control their oil and your economy. And hence, you are attracting terrorist attacks on the United States of America. So that's exactly how it works. It's a vicious cycle. And how can we convert that into a virtuous cycle? I think there were some brilliant ideas for action over there. We'll open the floor to Amarjeet. I was two weeks ago in uh, Ahmedabad doing a workshop. And uh, while meeting some of the participants during tea time, I had an opinion that has been disturbing me for the last you know, couple of weeks. Quite a few people said that the reason why we are in a mess today is uh, thanks to Gandhi because of his non-violent movement. Because there was no blood spilt, because there was no, you know, sacrifice of the human life, we are absolutely taking our independence for granted. Now, this was a thought that came from the land of Gandhi and that disturbed me that there were so many people who were saying that we are in a mess today because of our non-violent freedom, because there was no blood spilt. Now, I want to know what your take is, because this has really, really disturbed me that, you know, coming from the land of Gandhi, that a thought process like this has gathered roots, and a lot of people are saying that. So, as a Gandhian, what are your thoughts on this particular aspect? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm a Gandhian scholar, a very good one, but not a struggling Gandhian. I cannot call myself Gandhian. It's very difficult to be Gandhian. A Gandhian scholar, sure, I'm a very good, nobody can teach Gandhi the way I can because of my guide. He was really good, taught me how to get into Gandhi's mind. Anyway, coming back to your question, you know, there are all this thing that Gandhi is also responsible for the partition of India, for parti this, that and the other. But m there's only one answer. I think let's move beyond Gandhi. You know, Gandhi did what he had to and has moved on. The question today is not what Gandhi did and did not do. The question today is what are we doing? What is, I think I'm Mr. Tripathi? Pardon, sir? Uh, the, uh, the, the, question, the question today is what is Jerry doing? What is each one of us doing? Amarjeet. Yeah. Amarjeet. Ha, Amarjeet. What, what is, is Amarjeet doing? What is Amarjeet doing? Amarjeet <laughs> Asking doing? questions. If you want non-violent <laughs> conflict resolution, what are you doing for that? Chodo Gandhi ji ko. Unke piche kyo padna? Let's learn from Gandhi. How beautiful non-violent conflict resolution, the legacy, Satyagraha. We don't even know the salt march. We've never analyzed it. Abroad, everybody's analyzed it. What happens when you do a Satyagraha? How even the fasting, this fasting Satyagraha, it is a, 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 a spiritual uh, process. And you know, it's because non-violence is also spiritual. 
just as there are violence is structural, physical, mental, emotional, subtle, in the same way non-violence is also, you know, it has used, so it's a science, non-violence is a science, we don't understand Gandhi, ko. and we keep on saying this, I don't agree at all with this, this is escaping from our responsibilities, the question is what can we do today, let's, and how we can learn Gandhi and apply him. Yeah. Thank you. I agree with Dr. Agarwal. I think Gandhi, Gandhi ji had a lot of personal flaws and probably allowed himself to get manipulated Who by doesn't? a few people also. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? But I think be the change that you want yeah. to see in the world was his message to the world. Yeah. And that's a Gandhian message. Mm. And I think, you know, when, when I hear people, like I had said on my first, when I hear people giving rhetoric, like mm. Majburi ka naam Gandhi ji, huh. I always realize how weak they are because they don't mm. understand the power of simplicity and humility. That's power, not arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that simply we can learn mm -hmm. from the best always, but we always tend to look at the worst. Yes. So and also it's to that. corroborate what you say, when uh, we got the independence, Gandhi ji kitne udas the, mm -hmm. and he want, went to Nokla, you know, on that. Sure. Uh, but, but, but there, but, but, one uh, foreign yeah. correspondent yeah. asked him give a message to the world, and he gave one sentence: "My life is my message." Absolutely. How many of us can say that? But I, I think mean, where Amarjeet and yeah. probably even I come from is, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm a big, big uh, fan and uh, my, my biggest hero is Bhagat Singh. Mm -hmm. And I remember Bhagat Singh, who was a big Gandhi follower, was mm -hmm. a very disillusioned because somewhere he felt that he did not take the right stand. So there, there is a, ah, there, there, there are, there are issues. So we sure, can kind of sure. debate that over tea. Yes. <laughs> sure. Very insightful, uh, you know, listening to you. Uh, I would like to reflect you on, you know, the current dilemmas we have in Indian state. For example, how violence has been built into our public domain. Uh, if you look at the... Vichy, you'll have to just be a little loud and speak yeah. into the microphone. So, I'm talking about, uh, say, for example, indigenous tribes, 8% of our population whose livelihoods are threatened because of mining activities, or the kind of investments on coast which is leading to displacement of coastal communities, right? And then large number of population, you know, lost their traditional livelihood. And if you look at the violence, just not cities, but also violence that happens with the women. You know, violence has been built over a period of time because of the indifference of the polity or the governance. How do Gandhians reflect, especially from the perspective of the most marginalized, whose lives are being threatened because of onslaught of, you know, modern economic forces? Well, uh, I'd just like to say this, that, uh, you know, violence is of many times, types and you're talking about structural violence. So this is which is built into the structure. So you, have to, you need to change the, the structure. And Gandhi, I think, uh, to make it short, you see, Gandhi's religion is what? Dharidra Narayan. Simple. Uh, you know, and uh, he says also that if you ask me, uh, what is my religion? I, he never said I'm a Hindu. He said, look at my life, how I sit, walk, talk, behave in general. And uh, that is my religion. I'll just, I'm just giving you an indirect answer. Then he, he, was, he was asked, what God do you believe in? He's, what is God? He said, uh, 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 take a value, clothe it with life and you have God. So, you know, Gandhi's, and then Dharidra Narayan, the least of your, and Christ says it too, if you did it to the least of your brethren, you did it to me. So Dharidra Narayan, Dharidra means the poorest of the poor or the marginalized person. If you treat that person as something, as God, then you solve your problems. So our development structure is like that. Development is faulty. This is structural violence. So it has to come via development. Again, our development policies are faulty. So if, of course it's violence. Poverty is the worst form of violence. And even you marginal, not looking after marginalized is definitely violence. Yes, that so leads to violence. Structure has to uh, change. Yeah. How does that perspective uh, work? Because today, primarily, we are governed by financial wars. Uh, all across to make us uh, so uh, imperatively obligated that you have to die under your own, you know, uh, pressures. So, is there anything that you would like to uh, you mean, uh, take you on? Die that? As, because of uh, as in financial because of poverty, because of uh, yeah. uh, you know uh, the financial pressure that the world puts on a country like ours. Yes. Though we are extremely rich on the underground mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. that we can feed maybe. Uh, the entire uh, nation for the next uh, so, so that is what Gandhi's uh, charkha symbolized. You know, it, it was simply that the homegrown industry. And he was, I think, Nehru buried Gandhi. 
he did not follow him in education. Gandhi believed in nahi taaleem, ke grassroots se shuru karo, don't need a blackboard and a classroom to educate. Just copy, aadha time spinning karo, ya koi craft karo, aur usse paise leke add one school at a, one class at a time. How can and we implement something in today's time and age? Is there anything that you could give us as a generation that we could put in our lives right now, uh, you know? Uh, a small thing it could be, where yeah, it could I be think, uh, contributing uh, to there, there our could, own There could be a revolution if we only uh, bought silk made by art artisans, not industrial silk or refused to wear machine-made clothes. I mean, it's a tall order. But I do know one person, I really consider him Gandhian. I wanted to give him a gift on his, uh, a shirt on his birthday. He said, please don't give me. I said, why? He says, no, I have only seven kameezes, seven pants, seven kurtas pajamas. If I get more, I will give them. So I think this is the concept of Gandhi's trusteeship or the aparigraha. You know, Gandhi practiced 11 vows during his life. The seven from the Hindu tradition, aparigraha, satya, satya, ahimsa, all that. So aparigraha, you don't have more than what possessions. We should do away with them or treat them as trustees. And all the, all the people here in this room, including Jerry, I think we in a way treat, do treat uh, ourselves as trustees and try to use minimalistic, that basically, minimalistic austerity which we have been speaking about. A parigra is not having more than what you need. And I do know a lot of people all over the world who don't uh, uh, take their cars, they use their public transport or whatever. So, I mean, the, there is. And by the way, only in India we don't have taxpayers for peace. But in most of the European countries where I get to lecture, in fact, they call me and give me the tax they have collected that year. They refuse to pay the tax. The, uh, you know, you can calculate how mm -hmm. dene hote hai per person for the defense tax. And okay. they refuse to pay it. Wo alag baat hai that the government can get into their accounts and attach it. Absolutely. But only in our country we don't have. And it's only in our country that now October 2nd was declared the International Day for Nonviolence by the UN. And can I explain how that happened in sure, half sure. a minute? Half a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, that is my idea. And I'll tell you how it came about. Because Hamari government is unthinking. They're not, they can't think. So uh, there, were, there was this big, on Gandhiji's Satyagraha Centennial, uh, so 100 years of Satyagraha, Sonia Gandhi invited 69 countries, very, very big international bash at Vigyan Bhavan. So the Ministry of External Affairs invited me to write her speech and her declaration because I'm a Gandhian scholar. They also paid me 15,000 rupees for it. So in that declaration and in that I put that October 2nd should be declared the International Day for Nonviolence by the UN. Before this, for seven years we had been, <laughs> you know, uh, asking the Indian government to do it and to take it up with the UN. They didn't. But when I put it in that, and of course she spoke at that international forum and we got it. Thank you. And, um, Brilliant. <laughs> so in a way it is great that people in government can't think because we can infiltrate their thoughts. That's exactly how we, yeah. we've been working also, yeah. right? Because, yeah. because if they start thinking, they'll think all the wrong things, not the right things. Right. So <laughs> thank you, Roshni ji. And thank maybe you. have a certificate. As a closing note, Anand Sharma met me at a party and told, because I also put in that nonviolent defense. Right. Because in uh, USA, people personally have started this nonviolence academy. Absolutely. So I went to the government and said, Hum to land of Gandhi hai, Buddha hai, let's start this nonviolence academy. Brilliant idea. So then uh, they said, uh, no, no, no. Uh, we are not mad like you and you should be <laughs> arrested for treason. So Thank you, ma'am. Thank government. you, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you, Dr. Subhan Agrawal. We have a young volunteer, Mr. Hunar Brar, give you a certificate for speaking. Thank you, Thank you so much.